administration. It is our responsibility to protect the rights and well-being first of American citizens. We are a secular nascent state, not a theocracy. A great deal of, um, it would be um, important, I think, that we express some of our interest in seeing how immigration is impacting Americans in their wages and their salaries and their national security and recent immigrants to our country uh, through some of the policies that are being uh, um, adopted by our country. It was just five months ago that Kate Steinle died in her father's arms on a pier in San Francisco because of a repeatedly deported criminal alien set free. What about American workers at Disney forced to train their replacements? They claim they were discriminated against because they were Americans. Does this bill help them? We've not done anything on these issues. We have these fights over and over, but we never seem to advance a proposal that actually protects Americans more effectively. So that is the context, I think, today. When we can... Can I ask the senator a question? Would he yield for a question? Uh, briefly. Uh, so are you saying it protects Americans if we have a religious test on who comes into this country? Well, I'll discuss that, uh, Senator Leahy. I'm just saying that uh, if you propose this resolution. You haven't proposed any resolution that fixes some of the problems I just mentioned. And it's time for us Senator to Senator may that recall I had a bill before this uh, committee, which the Senate voted, I think, 68 votes and for it, that did protect America. Rejected by the House and over my opposition. Um, so the adoption of the Leahy Amendment would constitute a transformation of our thoughts about immigration. In effect, it's a move toward the ratification of the idea that global migration is a human right and a civil right for those of us in the United States, and that these immigrant rights must be supreme to the rights of nations, sovereign nations, to determine who can and cannot enter their borders. Fundamentally, foreign nationals living in foreign countries do not have a constitutional right to enter the United States. If they did, any alien denied entry could file suit to demand entry, claim damages for loss of employment, lost welfare benefits or income if they believe they were improperly denied. Our immigration system derives exclusively from Article 1, Section 8, Clause 4 of the United States Constitution, which vests the exclusive power in the Congress to establish a uniform system of immigration. Uh, through acts of Congress, the United States can and does exclude aliens from, from entry into the United States for a whole number of, of reasons. These rules governing the selection of immigrants are by deficit, definition opposite the rules governing the treatment of citizens living or naturalized in the United States. There are 7 million billion people in the world choosing who can immigrate into the United States is by definition an exclusionary process. The goal is to select immigrants for admission based on the benefits they provide to the society, based on skills, ages, values, philosophy, income, etc. We, our goal is to choose for admission those likeliest to succeed and flourish and crucially uh, to support the constitutional system of government and our values of pluralism and Republican constitutional governance. So whereas we consider it improper to deny employment to a U.S. citizen, say, based on their age, we consider it necessary and important to consider immigrants according to their age and whether or not they will be able to contribute productive work to our American society. As stated by the Supreme Court, quote, whatever the procedure authorized by Congress is, it is due process as far as an alien denied entry is concerned. What this agree amendment would do would to turn this fundamental principle on its head, I fear and to apply some of our core domestic legal constitutional protections to foreign nationals with no tie to the United States. The natural extension of this concept would fundamentally undermine entire provisions of immigration law, and the results quickly 
would become radical if this principle were to be adopted, not just on religion, but throughout the immigration system. In the United States, we have protections against discrimination by religion, age, disability, by country of origin. We have freedom of association, the rights of due process. Now imagine extending these as part of our immigration system. The logical extension of this concept results in a legal regime in which the United States cannot deny an alien admission to the United States based on age, health, skill, family, criminal history, country of origin, and so forth. If an elderly alien who needed 24-hour medical care applied for entry and was denied under this scheme of immigration rights, they, would, they could file a lawsuit, perhaps, demand entry and taxpayer funding. But let's consider the question of religion more carefully. It's so important. If we say it is improper to consider religion, even consider it, then that means it's improper for a consular official to even ask about a candidate's religious beliefs when trying to screen an applicant for entry. They do this regularly. It would mean that even asking questions of a fiancé seeking a visa about his or her views on any religious matter, say on the idea of pluralism versus religious supremacy, would be improper because it's improper to favor or disfavor a religion. It is improper, you could say, to favor or disfavor any interpretation of a religion, even if it is a perversion of a religion. It's still a religion to that person. Are we really prepared to disallow in the consideration of tens of millions of applications for entry to the United States any questions about religious views and attitudes? This amendment would mean, for instance, that the United States could not favor for entry. And we, maybe we don't want to do this. Could you favor for entry a moderate, moderate Muslim cleric over a radical Muslim cleric? We have huge unrest in the Middle East. We know that. It's unfortunate. It's a humanitarian disaster. And I wish we could do more about it and fix it now. Uh, but there's a strong argument to made, be made that we should focus on settling uh, Muslim immigrants uh, in the region or m maybe allow some uh, immigration. But what about giving a priority to Yazidis or Christians who are subject to even greater persecution than normal? I have an Alabama Christian former Special Forces dentist who volunteered to go to Turkey to work in the camps to treat people. And he told me about this eight-year-old Yazidi girl, he was in tears telling about it, who'd lost 24 members of her family. She had one uncle and this girl still left because uh, uh, of their religion. Keep in mind, current refugee law requires us to consider persecution of a group on account of an individual's religion. This would ask us to discard or undermine that practice. A U.S.-born citizen who subscribes to theocratic Islam has a freedom of speech here that allows them to give a sermon and denounce the Constitution and ask for it to be changed. But under this amendment, a foreign religious leader living overseas could demand a tourist visa to deliver the same sermon and claim religious discrimination if not approved. I think it's a dangerous step. The next step, of course, if we say religion cannot be considered in any way, is to say we cannot consider history or geography or culture. We need to take a holistic decision about how we evaluate immigrants. We cannot labor under the illusion that these are simple binary decisions. It's not an, as though every applicant is either clearly tied to terrorists on the one hand or is absolutely safe on the other. Many people are radicalized after they enter. How do we screen for that possibility? If we cannot even ask about a person's views on religion and what, what it means for them as they carry out that religious view in the years to come, would we forbid questions about politics or theology from our consular officials? 
Furthermore, some of the same supporters of this very amendment supported the Lautenberg Amendment that gave special preferences for admission under our refugee program to Jews, evangelical Christians, Orthodox Christians, Baha'i, and religious minorities, all to the exclusion, obviously, of others. The import of this is that hundreds of thousands of individuals have been admitted to the United States based exclusively on their religion. For just reasons, I would think normally, the rights have been neglected, that have been neglected by this Congress are the rights of the American people. Uh, we're not operating some kind of closed door immigration policy. The opposite is true. No nation on earth has let in more people over a shorter period of time. We've admitted 59 million immigrants since 1965. We've admitted 1.5 million immigrants from Muslim countries since 9-11. We have the largest foreign-born population in our history as a raw number, and soon the largest proportion um, of uh, non-native born uh, in the history of the Republic. As a share of population, we'll be breaking every historical record. Meanwhile, uh, we have uh, large companies uh, using exploiting programs to replace Americans with and undermine their wages. Poor screening has resulted in thousands of crimes against Americans. Our entitlement programs are stretched. Wages have been flattened for decades. Every year we admit another million permanent residents, nearly 100,000 refugees and asylees, and 700,000 foreign guest workers are here. Though it appears, um, I think we should have a conversation soon about how to help the tens of millions of Americans who are just scraping by. That's what we need to be thinking about. Now, so Senator Leahy presents us a bold, dramatic sense of the Senate resolution mm -hmm. that strikes at our heart and pulls at our well, values well, because we favor free exercise of religion. A serious discussion, colleagues, I believe is needed before we take this step. Certainly the point is pressed as a result of political statements, and I've tried to avoid commenting on those statements because I don't know how to firmly answer it. I don't know what the right response is. Frankly, we need to be careful how we think about this. Uh, certainly Jefferson and Madison spent years of contemplation and work on their founding of America's philosophies. So the resolution that's been offered highlights America's deep commitment to a free exercise of religion. We celebrate that. The question of religion and violent religious disagreements engendered in Europe prior to our founding, were well known to the founding fathers. Jefferson and Madison had an answer. They felt one in the Virginia statutes of religious freedom. Jefferson was very proud of that, put it on his tombstone, if I remember. Gary Wills, a great writer, not George Will, but Gary, the liberal person who writes on religious issues, writes insightfully about it in his, in his book, head and heart about how we got uh, founded. We have to use our head and our heart. We do not allow a religious test for holding office. We allow free exercise of religion. We ban the establishment of a state-sponsored church. It's in the Constitution explicitly. Encompassed in the right of free exercise of religion is the duty to permit others to exercise their religion freely and not in some diminished state. But as with all rights, none can be absolute. I remember Federal Judge Virgil Pittman in Mobile agreeing to hear the petition of a prisoner who declared he was a bishop in the church of the New Song and that its doctrines call for steak and wine every Friday night, and he demanded that the prison provide him that. The judge gave him a hearing. The judge wouldn't call him bishop, so he said, I'm not going to call you Judge Pittman. And um, that was the way the hearing went. But he got his hearing, and he, he lost his case. No person can declare their religious. Religion allows the use of illegal drugs, nor to use violence to enforce its doctrines, nor physically abuse women, nor marry underage children, no matter how deeply held those views might be. But that's not the question here. It is well settled that applicants don't have a constitutional right or a civil right to man entry into the United States. 
In fact, the INA has this provision. We have that provision. You have the provision. And it says this, whenever the president finds, this is our law today, whenever the president finds that the entry of any aliens or any class of aliens into the United States would be detrimental to the interest of the United States, he may by proclamation and for such period as he shall deem necessary suspend the entry of all aliens or any class of aliens as immigrants or non-immigrants or impose on the entry of aliens any restrictions he deems appropriate. That's the, what the law is. Um, I assume provisions like that are in the laws of every nation world over. So we accept those who we believe will advance our country's interests and that's what secular states do. And we are a secular government. As leaders, we are to seek the advancement of the public interest. While billions of immigrants may benefit by moving to this country, we only have one responsibility. We must decide if such admission complies with our law and serves our national interest. Now, religion is highly respected in America. Jefferson and Madison believed one's relationship to God was a matter between the believer and God. It was not a matter to be dictated by the state. Jefferson's words chiseled in his monument reflect uh, this unique American view. I swear eternal hostility over any domination of the mind of man. So we must respect our brothers and sisters across the globe who have different views about God, faith, and religion, even as we may disagree on religious matters. In America, we value free discussion as a method of reaching a higher truth, even changing our minds or another's minds in the course. And we don't believe someone should be killed if they change their mind. Wills said, as I remember, Washington and others at the time used the phrase toleration of other religious views, but he says Jefferson and Madison went further, giving re more respect to defending dissenting and different views than toleration. So based on the Supreme Court interpretations of the Constitution, we can say with confidence that the establishment of an immigration policy has been given to Congress. Congress has not given rights to foreigners to go to court to demand entry into the United States. Neither does the Constitution. That's just plain fact. But uh, in truth, Senator Leahy doesn't so assert that the demands of his resolution are required by law or the Constitution. He insists that we must all agree that it is un-American to deny entry into America on account of one's religion. Un-American is a strong word. Liberals have never liked it used against their world visions. The communists certainly didn't like it used. To affirm such a resolution would mean that religion can never be taken into account to determine, to determine admissibility. Throughout all the ages, this great republic may exist in the years to come. I think we must apply a prudent cast of mind to our analysis. If there are circumstances we can foresee that would cause open-minded, logical, fair persons acting in the national interest to decide to act contrary to this resolution and be morally and legally justified in so doing, then it should not pass. We've conducted no analysis of this prospect. We haven't studied the ramifications of this. Uh, unless we can be sure of that, we should not pass the resolution. Most religions focus on uh, one's uh, relationship to God but many religions are much broader. Many of them, uh, they may think of religion, I think are strange and dangerous cults and, and criminal organizations. Uh, many uh, religions uh, go broader than personal relationship with God. They include uh, a belief in the ordering of government, what the laws should be and what public policy should be. 
Religions today too often are underappreciated, I truly believe, for the good they do in marriage, in divorce, in death, in birth, in sickness, in health, in poverty, and in wealth. Religious faith for millions, billions on a daily basis. Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, world over, are, are a force for good. Reality would be denied, however, if we do not recognize that dangerous and damaging religions and sects have arisen in time. At least some points, at at least some points in history, most religions or segments of these religions have sought to overcome human laws and rules and impose uh, doctrinal ideas that are contrary to good common sense and good policy. I even seek to destroy established governments because they perceive that God has ordered them to do so. So we may say they're not religions, but the, reli the adherents wouldn't say it's not a religion. They say they're adhering to their text, or their leader, or the revelation they have received. Don't the people of Jonestown, didn't they believe theirs was a religion, even as they took their own lives? Don't suicide bombers think they are religiously faithful? There are countless other examples that don't need to be listed now. What if a strong and growing religion believes their leader talks directly to God, that existing world governments are satanic and corrupt and must be violently overthrown? They insist the divine solution is a theocracy where God alone rules and rules justly. And now the time has come to challenge America. And evangelize, I guess the word would be, America. Secretary Carter said ISIS is growing. What if it expands even more ra rapidly and decides to focus its believers on a long-term effort to change the corrupt America? And their doctrines justify force, do they not? Can we say ISIS's form of religion is not a religion just because it's not consistent with classical Islam? Why could they not demand as strong a right to enter as a peaceful, meditating Buddhist? Is the national interest to admit the ISIS member equally with the Buddhist? Is it wrong to say that immigration must serve the legitimate interest of America and that others more likely than those and, and uh, that others are more likely than those committed to violent uh, ideologies? We can't admit everybody. Is it better to admit those who admire America, affirm its constitutional order, than those who would be unhappy, unfulfilled, until their vision for the country more closely parallels their religious vision, a government faithful to their theology, a theocracy? Again, sometimes religions believe that their goals go beyond personal salvation. They believe they are commanded to control the government and their doctrines must dominate over other religions, denying them freedom. Such religious people would have an unhappy time in America. Well, the ideal suggested by Senator Leahy's res resolution is um, valuable, and I think we all support and that we should respect people's religion. And maybe our nation, to be true to its ideals, should follow the Leahy Resolution firmly. Maybe it's correct. Maybe the common sense interest of our nation must fall to this rather extreme vision. But I don't think so. This is a dangerous injunction, colleagues. I don't think it's... It goes beyond being unwise. It's a reckless resolution, I fear. It is absolute and without qualification. It could have pernicious impacts for decades, even centuries to come. It may, it may be even a step uh, from the concept of the nation state to some sort of global citizenship. Such understandings have never been part of immigration law in America. The resolution lacks limits. Let's not act quickly. Let's think this through. Uh, in a time of intense political debate, uh, we don't need to be reacting, uh, making political points. I think it's deeply about what 
let's think deeply about what all this means and the ramifications of what it might be. Uh, let's don't. Uh, so I urge a no vote. Now a roll call vote on the uh, uh, Leahy Amendment as amended by the Session Amendment. Call the roll. Mr. Hatch. Uh, aye by proxy. Mr. Session. No. Mr. Brand. Aye by proxy. Mr. Cornish. Aye by proxy. Mr. Lee. Mr. Cruz. No by proxy. Oh, yeah. Mr. Clay. Aye by proxy. Mr. Bitter. No by proxy. Mr. Purdue. Aye by proxy. Mr. Tillis. No. Mr. Leahy. Aye. Mr. Feinstein. Aye. Mr. Schumer. Aye by proxy. Mr. Nervin. Aye. Mrs. Whitehouse. Aye. Mrs. Klobuchar. Aye. Mr. Franken. Aye by proxy. Aye. Mr. Blumenthal. Aye. Aye by proxy. I <laughs> mean aye. <laughs> Grassley, aye. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Mr. Chairman, the vote is 16 yeas, 4 nays.